Welcome to worship at St. Andrews, whether you're with us here in the, uh, in the sanctuary or online, we are here to joyfully sing to our God who has loved us from the beginning and before the foundations of the earth were laid, has sent his son for us to redeem us, has only good and mercy and kindness for us and to all who reach out to him. He has done great things for us through Jesus Christ. So let us stand and worship our God together and lift up our voice and our heart and our joy and our troubles and our trials with thanksgiving. the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. For in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. 
For God demonstrates his great love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For this is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. And God raised us up with Christ in order that he might show his incomparable riches of his grace. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
bow your heads in prayer. O thou great Jehovah, our Redeemer, guide, and friend, we praise you for your constant presence in our lives. In both the awful times and the amazing times, you are there. When we seek your strength and protection, you provide what we need. Even in our most ordinary times, we can find you in the most unexpected places. We praise you for surrounding us with your beautiful, powerful love. For even when we are at our lowest, you see us at our best. In gratitude for all you have done for us, we sing to you in joy and thanksgiving. Amen.
please be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, there's something noble and even majestic about we've, what we've just sung. We live, we move, we have our being because of your amazing love, and it is unexpected and shocking to our sin-soaked spirits. And so in prayer now, we ask your help. We ask you to break through and speak to our heart about those things that are unusual and unexpected. Lord, help us also for those tragic things that we've come to expect. In this last month, as it ended and now another one begins, we remember the people of this church who in these last few weeks have gone to be with you. And so, Lord, for the families of Doris Hawking, Mary Throop, Jack Geerlings, and Suad Batarsi. Would you ready their families, in fact, each of us, to step into a future that Jesus knows better than we do? We also, Lord, thank you for the good, true, and beautiful things that we also do not expect. Thank you, Lord, that you know us so fully and yet you love us so completely. Thank you that your spirit is shaping us and preparing us for eternity. And thank you, Lord, today that as we come to the communion table, we experience something of the cross that we cannot imagine. Our minds may stumble on the cross, but we thank you, Lord, that our hearts can sing of the open tomb. And so, Lord, when we take the bread and the cup, may it today be no mere ceremony, but a holy moment where your eternity steps into our day and our situation, our grief, our problems, the details of our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, in this worship, in every way, Shock us again, surprise us with the unexpected forgiveness that is beyond our fondest dreams and the amazing love that is beyond all our expectations. We ask it in the name of Christ our Savior, amen. Well, it is once again an honor and privilege to welcome you to worship. One of the things that we do once a year is that we take an offering for the seminarians that our church has sponsored over the generations of this church. And so we'd like to let you know today a, a little glimpse of what that will be like, and we'll ask you then to pray that next week your offering would be one that Jesus has spoken to your heart about how much you would give. So have a look at the screens right now. So this program has really allowed me uh, and equipped me to understand God's call on my life and allowed me to use what I'm learning in school and in His Word and blending that day in and day out in the way that I lead, hopefully in the way that I love, in the way that we uh, choose our mission partners and in the way that we engage our church in serving both here locally and globally around the world. So the seminary education was really, at the time, my thought was just to help me be the best minister to students that I possibly could be. Um, but in time, that diploma also led towards my ordination with ECO, and in time, that turned into pastoring positions that now that seminarian fund doesn't just serve me, it serves the congregations that I pastor now. And so really it's an investment not just in an individual, it's an investment in future congregations um, that they will serve down the road. And it really felt like receiving that and the constant encouragement of the community at St. Andrews was their way of saying, we are cheering for you on the side of the road as you run, as you do this race, as you do this long marathon, which is in a Presbyterian world, it is a really long race. And funding on top of all of the studying and all of the things, having someone step in and say, we want to help you because we believe in you and we're cheering for you, makes all the difference in the world. And it is what the body of Christ is for. 
going to seminary is a big financial commitment. And when you're already doing, when you're already in full-time ministry and you have a life outside of that, then adding seminary is a lot. Not having to have the financial worry about how you're going to pay for it has been something that has allowed me to be more fully present. It has also been, um, for me, highly motivational for me to honor the process of being a student, of absorbing the learning, of applying the learning in a way that honors those who have invested in me. If you're considering giving to the Seminarian Fund, one of the things that I might encourage you to think about is not only with this investment would you be changing the life of that student, but you would be changing the lives of the people that they come into contact with that are they're serving at St. Andrews, but also in congregations that they will serve down the road. And what we do is important work, and you want people to be as equipped as possible to do that. So I'd encourage you to get involved in this fund if you have the ability to do so. Ministry continues on because you trained me and you launched me. So thank you, St. Andrews. You will always be my church family, and I'm so grateful that you invested in me and saw, saw the giftedness and made sure that I made it all the way through. And so I'd just like to give you a, a genuine thank you, um, not only for the education, but for connecting me to Fuller Seminary, which continues to help me grow. And then on behalf of the congregations that I'm able to serve, thank you for um, equipping me to hopefully serve them well. Your investment into God's call over my life and into me personally has made me feel loved. Honestly, I think you're just superheroes. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really have the words, uh, or I guess words don't feel adequate to be able to communicate how incredibly grateful I am um, for sowing into my life. So we encourage you this week to be in prayer for what God may do for a special offering over and above your commitment to God's work uh, through the year. And that ongoing commitment, as well as then on top, the additional moments of generosity, is one of the reasons why Timberly and I are always so excited to do what we believe the Lord calls us to do. We talk about giving our tithes and our offerings for Timberly and I, the tithe is that first situation, that first commitment at the beginning of the year of how much we will give to the work of the Lord. And the offerings are those additional moments where God says, I want you to do a little bit more. And sometimes those a little bit more moments are the most exciting for us, the most invigorating to our faith and our excitement. And so we encourage you to join us in now in this time and in the days ahead, let's bring to the Lord his tithe and our offerings, amen.
if you have ever parented young children, or if you are going to parent young children, I'm sure you've heard these words in response to this question. Why did you do that? <laughs> I don't know. How many have heard those words? I, some of you, most of us have probably said those words when we were a child. I don't know. What is, what is your motivation for doing that? I have no idea. You know, but that's really one of the things that is important for us as individuals is we, t we pause and reflect on what motivates us to do and the life the way we do it, to make the choices that we make. What is motivating us? What is driving us behind, pushing us, calling us forward? It's a good, it's a, it, it really is an important part of self-awareness because a lot of folks are not self-aware of their emotional responses and where they're coming from. You know, all of our growing up stuff gets entangled. But the question of what's, what's our motivation? You know, Freud says that we ha he has what was, is called the uh, pleasure principle, that we make choices towards, uh, away from pain and towards that which is comforting and, 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 and gives us pleasure or comfort. Uh, for others, I uh, would say that, you know, what motivates them is, is prestige or fame. Uh, so that's why, you know, why they wear a, you know, fancy watch, the importance of what kind of bag they're carrying, what kind of clothes they're wearing, all those kinds of things. I think that's a veneer top. I think behind that is really the issue is people are looking for a life that is significant. They're making choices, trying to figure out what is significant. They may not understand what gives them significance, but they're trying for it. Jesus talks about what motivates him. And we are in a series called Follow Me, a life worth sharing. And as I think about a life worth sharing, a life worth imitating, a life that I, the, the lives that I have read about, the lives that I know that call my life to something more significant, that raises the bar of life for me. I have men and women in my, my world that I've read about, that I've met, that I've seen, and they are just in a category of their own. And they make me want to step up deeper into what I'm about. So the, they, their very life motivates me. Jesus talks about his motivation in, John, in the gospel according to John. What drives him, what moves him. And the situation is he has just had the encounter at the well with the woman at the well. And he sends his disciples off to go get some food. And uh, she returns. So just hear this. Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat you know nothing about. And then the disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him some food? My food, he says, my meat, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now the harvest of the crop for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows, another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Very interesting that Jesus talks about the food that drives him, his, his, his motivations to, to his ministry and life, and then he, starts, he shifts to the harvest. What's he doing there? I think what he's, he's focusing on, what drives me, what compels me, what feeds me, what energizes me is to do the will of my Father in heaven who has sent me here. And I'm going to complete that work. And on the cross, he, always, he says the words, it is finished. <clears throat> and then he's turning to the reapers. He sowed, he did the hard work, we do the harvest. 
And so now he's focusing his disciples on, this is going to be your end of the job, and on, on your, your focus. Your call of your life is to complete the work that I have done in bringing that good news to him. And in fact, in Acts chapter 1, it says, talks about the ministry that Jesus began, and you and I finish. So as I take a look at what it means to be a disciple for myself, and these are so it was sort of my, my own, my personal reflections. And I want to have, I want to know Jesus and part of my understanding of following him is to have a life that imitates him, a life that mimics him. Our little granddaughter who's 16 months now, I think, uh, we got a video of her she, and um, she would pick up her little cuddly toys and she would hold them and go, oh. And she's mimicking what happens when we do to her when she falls down or something. We, we, oh, we, hold, we, we're, we comfort her. So she's mimicking that. Hopefully she will be, continue to mimic the good things and, uh, as she makes her decisions to see that's a good thing. I'm going to put that in my life. I want to mimic Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I want to look at Jesus and see how he did life and I want to do life that way. We don't, if we want the life that God has for us, we've got to take on the mind of Christ. In fact, that's what we're told in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Hear this. Let this mind be in you, or this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped after, something to be robbed. Remember back in the garden, Adam and Eve, eat this fruit, you'll become like God. They grasped after equality with God. Lucifer did the same thing in Isaiah. But he made himself nothing. And taking on the very nature of a servant, he made himself in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. And was obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He humbled himself and he was obedient to the death of the cross. So I want to be like him. My posture is not my will, but yours, that I need to humble myself before God. Lord, I want. I am your servant, you are not mine. Let's just take a look at how we pray. God, do this, do this, God, do this. We, you know, do we ever pause and say, God, what do you want to do? What do you want me to do? And so part of my understanding and my following Christ is not only to have his mind, but to see what motivated him. And what motivated him was to do the will of, the, of, of his father. That word will in the Greek, thylema there, means heartfelt desire. It's heartfelt desire. There's another Greek word called bule, which means God's mental resolve. That's used in this situation. It was God's will, God's mental resolve that Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross and rise from the dead and salvation would be found only in him. That's the done deal. There's no plan B. But often when we're talking about the will of God, it's God's heartfelt desire. It's God's heartfelt desire that we abstain from sexual immorality. Is it going to force you to do that? No. But it's his heartfelt desire. Why? Because it's better for you. It's God's heartfelt desire that you love one another. Is he going to force that on you? No. But that's the better way of doing love. Oh, much of God's will is his heartfelt desire. Just as you as a parent or grandparent... You have a heartfelt desire for your children, your grandchildren to do well, to love one another, to ex excel at life. You have that heartfelt desire. That is what this means here. So I want to have this posture of, of, of knowing God's will, of doing God's will. Your heartfelt desire in my life. You know, we pray that in the Lord's Prayer. You've said it probably hundreds, if not thousands of times over your life. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are those empty words or are we, we really mean them, Lord? I want your heartfelt desire realized in not just the world, because, we, boy, the world would be really better if they just do it our way. 
right? How about this? Lord, let your will be done in my life, in my heart, in my mind, in my desires, in my words. Let everything about me be brought into conformity with your heart's felt desire because that'll change the world around you. And that's the way I pray that prayer. God, let your will be done first in me. Let it be done first in me. So why would one want to do, seek out the will of God? What, God, what do you want me to do and why am I going to do it? One of the things for me is that John, what Jesus says in John chapter 14. So hear these words. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is the, uh, the night that he was going to, uh, uh, before he goes to the cross. If you love me, you'll obey all my commands. Well, we could just stop there and go home. If you love me, you'll obey all my commands. My children now, well, when they were teens, they, they, they said, Dad, what do you want for Father's Day? Father's Day's coming in June. Mother's Day's next month. Dad, what do you want for Father's Day that I can put in a box? Because when they were younger, and if you ever meet them, you say, what would your dad want for Father's Day? And their response was, he will tell you obedience. <laughs> they say, what do you want for Father's Day? I said, obedience. Why, because I'm a, a tyrant? No, because I know on the whole their life would do better if they did it with the wisdom of an older life giving them counsel. So now it's like, Dad, what do you want that I could put in a box? <laughs> but Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, he'll give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. This is the Spirit of God who dwells within us. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you'll see me because I live, you will also live. But on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Talk about Christian spirituality. And whoever has, has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He says it again. And he who loves me will be loved by, by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. He says that three times. Three times is an interesting number in the Hebrew mind because it really is like focusing on the importance of things. If you love me, you'll do what I command. My motivation is I, 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 I love you, Jesus. I want to love you not only in word, not only with my heart, not only with my emotions, but I want to live that love out. Jesus' love language is obey him. You know, in our marriages, and our relationships, we understand how our our, our partners, our wives, our husbands, how they, ex how they receive love, what makes them feel loved and what does, doesn't. What, how do we demonstrate that love? Here, what Jesus is telling us, this is how you can really prove that you do love me. Take a look and do what I've told you to do. Don't say I love you and then ignore my word because that's, that, is, that means that I, you don't love me. And so my motivation is I want to be like Jesus. I want to have the same mind as Jesus. And I want to demonstrate to him and live out to him my love and devotion to him because he's loved me more than I could ever know. When I sit and contemplate of what we have sung, that he went to a cross and shed his blood for someone who didn't care for a good portion of my life. And he loved me still. And he'll never stop loving me. The, Father, the scripture says that when you have come to Christ Jesus, nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of the Father in Christ Jesus. What can we do but love him back? And when we've really tasted his love, our response is to love him back. Not that he loved us, but that, that, that we love him, but he first loved us. And so when I think about doing the will of the Father and wanting the will of God in my life, one of the things I took, take, turn to 
uh, about that will because what we often do is we reduce that prayer of Jesus from not my will to your will and we often transliterate that if you won't give me what I want I'll take what you'll give true I may not get what I want but I'll get take what you give what was Jesus praying in the in the garden father if I can not drink of this cup what was that cup? That was the cup of his wrath. He was going to become the object of his wrath for you and for me. If there's a way around this, Father, I would like to know that, but I will do your will, and if this is necessary for them, I will do it. That's a paraphrase. Not my will, but yours. And for a long time when I was a young Christian, I used to think sort of that was an acquiescent to something. All right, I'll give up asking rather than realizing what I was really saying with those words. And I'm t- we use those words in a complex, non-moral situation. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, I don't need to pray to the Lord, whether it is will or not, that I steal money from the church. I don't need to ask that question. Or that I cheat on my taxes. Or that I drive 100 miles an hour down the street. I don't need to ask if that's his will or if he's okay with that. You know, why? Because it's pretty much here in the scriptures. But when Susan and I were trying to discern whether or not the Lord would have us come here to St. Andrews for this period of transition, that was a complex question. That had no moral implications. Our prayer was, Lord, Show us your will so that we can do it. We want to do your heart's desire. We don't want to do this because it looks good, because we think we can do it, because of all these other issues. The only thing we wanted to know is, Lord, do you want us to do this? Is this your will for us? Is this your will for St. Andrews? We're told in Romans chapter 12, hear these words. Therefore, I urge you, sisters and brothers, in view of God's mercy, in view of the great salvation you have in Christ Jesus, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That's offer your life and who you are as a sacrifice to God, a living sacrifice for his service and for his glory. You're holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. I don't know if you ever thought that your life and the way you're doing your life is an act of worship to our God. He says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't let the world press you into its mold. Don't be like the world in all of its darkness, like that world which doesn't know God, that wars against the goodness of God and the holiness of God. Don't let it press you in with its thoughts and its motivations and its assumptions. No, but be transformed. The word there is metanoia. We get, it's the going from a a caterpillar to a butterfly. Metamorphosis is the word that we get from it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think differently. Change your mind. How do you do that? You get the book into your mind and the mind and then and then into your heart and soul. And it says when you do that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, what his thelema is, what his heart's felt desire is. It says these three things about it, that it's good. It says that it is pleasing. It says that it is perfect. Why would we want anything else? Why would I not say, Father, not my will, but yours? Because what I'm saying there is, I don't want mediocrity I want your good, perfect, pleasing perfection in my life. And I want to surrender to that. Because when I'm surrendering to that, I'm surrendering to his love. Notice it says, good, not easy. It says, pleasing, not convenient. It says, perfect, not comfortable. When Jesus said, not my will, but yours, he was not embracing the ease. 
and the comfort and the convenience. But he was embracing the good and the pleasing and the perfect. And we have to separate the idea out that because something is good, it is easy. Ask any woman who has given birth. Is it good? Amazing. Was it easy? Didn't look like it to me. I know of one woman who said to her husband, you're never touching me again in the middle of transition. <laughs> Another said to her husband, you did this to me. It was good, but not easy. It pleases God, and ultimately it will please you. It may not look like it at the moment, but it ultimately it will be what is pleasing you. I remember when I was walking out of my mother's home, I stopped home, I was in law school, I was studying for the first year exams, and on the way out the door, because I was locked up in an apartment with five friends and we were cramming all week long, as I go, went out the door, she said, why don't you go into the ministry? And as I slammed the door, I hollered, I will never go into the ministry. And God said, oh yeah? <laughs> I would never do anything else than what God has called me to do. Such a privilege. Has it been good? It has been wonderful. Has it been easy? Ask any pastor how easy this job is. The average career length of a pastor is five years because it hurts. Is it pleasing? If it pleases God and ultimately is pleasing me, I, Susan, and I have been, been invited into the holy moments of people's lives, into those moments of joy and those moments of tears, and it has been a privilege. Is it perfect? Whatever God says to do will be perfect. This is the will of God. This is, this is what it means to be a follower of Christ, which is to have that, that posture he had, that attitude he had, is, Lord, I will obey what you, you, you want me to do. My heart's desire is to do your will, and I will search that will out. Where do you find the will of God? Well, you could start here in the book. You know, love one another. The, you know, all of those one another passages, it is throughout. It is, it is rich. This book is pregnant with counsel on how to do the will of God. And Jesus said, do be, be, I want you to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We want to build our life as a follower of Christ. You want to, do you want to build it on the rock? How many would say, yes, I want to build my life on the rock? And you know, I ask Christians to go, what is the rock? They go, it's Jesus. Right? Hey, that's what I hear. It's, you know, it's like the child that comes up for the children's sermon. And the pastor says, what's got a bushy tail and collects rocks and lives in trees. And the little kid says, well, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sounds like a squirrel. <laughs> no, Jesus said, no, it's not me. If you do what I say, you are building your house on the rock. That's what he said. And that's the life of an adventure. That's a life worth sharing. Surrendering to the love of God for us who gave himself for us to do his will and his heart's desire every day in my relationships and what I do with my heart, my time, my, my wealth. Everything about me, Jesus, is for your glory. Because that's all you're going to have left to offer him. Amen? Bless you. Let's pray. And Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ, who, whose motivation for life was to do your will, your heart's desire, and because of that, all who put their faith in him will not perish but have eternal life. Because on that night, he said, not my will but yours. Lord, may we always seek to know and do your will, that we might be 
followers of Christ who have a life that calls others into something more significant and more wonderful. That our lives would be a reflection of your goodness and of your glory and of your strength, of your joy and of your power. Forgive us when we spent so much energy worrying about what we want and not what you would want for us. And right now, Lord Jesus, I invite you with me. You whisper this prayer, dear Jesus, I reconsecrate my life to you. I want to know and do your will. Let your will be done in my heart and in my mind. Let it be done with my time and my days. May I be chained to your heart and to your will because I know it is good and it is perfect and it is pleasing. And in all that I do, may I bring you glory and honor as Jesus, you brought glory and honor to the Father. And God's people said, On the night our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he took a cup. They had had three cups, though this one was the cup of salvation. And when he took the bread, he offered it to his disciples and said, this is the, my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. The cup he took, he lifted it up, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, new agreement. The new commitment of the Father that as you eat this bread and drink this cup, we show the Lord's death, but his blood was for the forgiveness of our sins. And all who would turn to him, our sins, past, present, future, will be cleansed by his sacrifice. So I invite you to take a piece of bread from the top of your cup to him who knew and did the Father's will for you and me. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of him. And peel back the foil. This is the blood of the new covenant of our Savior. For God's will was that none would perish, but all might be saved. Drink it in remembrance of him. And Father, we thank you for your great love for us and for sending Christ Jesus for us. We thank you that as we eat and drink, we do spiritually, we are fed the body and blood of Christ. We pray that your spirit would take the grace that comes at the sacrament and Lord, you would fill our being with the, the passion for you and for your ways and for your heart. We thank you for such great salvation that you've given us, an eternity of joy and wonder and splendor. Thank you for your provision to us this day that you are always with us, that you never leave us, forsake us, that we can rejoice in the challenges of the day because our God holds us in the hollow of his hand. To you be the glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's stand and sing together the Lord's Prayer.
Amen and amen. Just a few things for you before you go. You'll find them in the bulletin. There are a number of things happening in the days ahead. Please take notice of what's in your bulletin. We also want to let you know that immediately after this service, we have two opportunities. One, of course, is the Bible study across the way in Daring Field, but also there's something new. And we would like you, if you are new to our congregation, to consider coming to the chapel to what we call Open Door. It's going to be an opportunity for you to spend time with a few of the pastors just to uh, ask any questions you'd like about what it means to be a part of this church or the way you might navigate it in the days ahead. So especially if you're new, consider coming to Open Door just across the way. And so it's my privilege now to offer you a benediction. Please bow your heads. For the one who has loved us so much that he invites us to lift up that white flag of surrender and let his will be ours, not out of a sacrifice of ourselves, but rather because it is best for us and pleasing to him. To him be all glory, honor, and praise. And so go in peace, love and serve the Lord, and know that the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit goes with you now, is with us always. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.